And uh, now I'd like to transition to our text. Uh, last Sunday, we've talked about John chapter 2. And we were talking, who, who remembers what we're talking about? Here's a test, you know, seven days ago. I know it's eternity. Is there anybody remember what we talked about? I should just say amen and just, just wrap it up now. Yeah. Cleansing of the table, that's right, Andre, thank you, brother. Oof, the lone voice of reason here, man. I know there's one person listening. But it, it, it's actually a good reminder for us that, friends, we're so bombarded with information, we're so bombarded with stuff in our life that we really need to make room for the things that we want to remember, whether it's taking notes or reflecting on it, reading scripture. So um, I hope that you're intentional about remembering what we're preparing for you here as much as possible. Um, so we've talked about John cleansing of the t- temple. In chapter 2 of the Gospel of John, and my microphone is still doing that, that wispy thing for some reason, um, we've read about, uh, about it in chapter 2 of John, verses 13 through 17, and there were five points that we've discussed. The first one is that Jesus is Lord and he has authority in his Father's house. Uh, We've talked about Jesus examining and kind of judging us, uh, and he does that in a way when he compares reality of how we are to what our purpose was, to the way we were designed to be, and those two realities are not the same. We uh, talked about how God hates some things that are happening in the church. He hates some things. He hates sin. He hates the, the, the situations when we are sinful. Uh, he uh, also cleanses and disciplines. He has a purpose in mind. He, 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 he changes us. His goal as part of that disciplining is, is for us to be more and more like Jesus, like him. And number five is we must fully submit to his discipline. So the way we react to God disciplining us is similar to the way kids would react to parents disciplining them, right? They can rebel and push back and and not learn anything from it, or they can understand the reasons, learn from it, and work on it. So it will be better better for them. So that was was what we've covered. And now we are continuing on that story because the story is not yet over. There is more conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees or the religious leaders of that time. And we need, to, we need to see how they respond so that we can learn from it. So let's read uh, John chapter 2 verses 18 through 22 together. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. I have a question for you. Have you ever been in a situation in your life when your sin has put you in a difficult place, in the difficult circumstances in life? Have you ever found yourself dealing with consequences of your sin to where maybe it was an addiction, maybe it was a sinful decision, maybe it was a really, really bad sinful decision, whatever it is, but now you are dealing with the reality of that sin, with the consequences of that sin, and God is speaking to you, whether through people, through scripture, or you're praying through circumstances, and God is confronting you with that sin... And when God confronted you with it, you knew what you should be doing. You knew what the right response would be. But because you really didn't want to do it, maybe it was painful, maybe it was difficult. So what you do is, Lord, if you really want me to do this, Give me a sign. 
Give me a sign, Lord. You know, if, if you do it this way, then I will know this is for sure true and this is something that you want me to do. And yes, I know I was sinful, and yes, I know that these are the circumstances, but it's hard, and everybody gets, gets, you know, these circumstances, but give me a sign, and then I will get it done. Anybody had those situations before? I did. I'm pretty sure most of us, if we really dig through our, our history and our life, we would find that we have situations like that, where that's exactly how... I would respond. I know what the right thing is. I know God is convicting me through the Holy Spirit in my heart that this is the wrong thing or here's how the right way of doing it might be. And you're resisting it a bit and saying, Lord, just you know, show me a sign that this is something that you want to happen. And so last week, we uh, studied Jesus confronting the sin of the people who allowed a sinful behavior to take place at the temple. We talked about the Gentiles court. Remember, there were four courts, and we were talking about the, the, the outside court. There was the, the, the priests, the, the court of Israel, uh, women's court, and then there was a court of Gentiles as part of this temple complex. And so we're talking about this outer court. Uh, it's a place where Gentiles or non-Jews, that's what Gentiles mean, non-Jews could come and worship. And the religious authorities have allowed for that place to be filled with a lot of business deals, with a lot of transactions. There were animals being sold. There was money being exchanged. There was, there was a lot of activity. And that is not in itself sinful, but because it was taking place at a temple, at a place of worship, it started replacing some of that worship. It started, worship became a kind of a secondary function, if you will, for what was happening in Gentiles' court. Instead of focusing on worship, they focused on selling sacrificial animals and changing of the currency. They focused on secondary things. And Jesus gets angry. This is one of the few times we see Jesus gets angry. He's rightfully so angry. He's, he's, he's experiencing this righteous anger because he loves the Father. And this is his Father's house. And he is the heir of the Father, and he is experiencing uh, uh, this zeal for what is happening. And in his righteous anger, he, he cleans out that house, he flips out the tables, he scatters the coin, he chases out the animals and the people who are selling them. When he saw what was happening, he was passionate about it. So the first thing I want you to take away from this passage is this. Jesus confronts sin that undermines the true worship of God. Jesus confronts sin that takes away from worshiping him and worshiping something else in your life. Because God created you and I to glorify him, to worship him in every single thing that we do. And when we gather together here as a church, when we gather together, it is especially true that we are here to worship Him. We're here to worship Him through prayer. We're here to worship Him through music. We're here to worship Him through serving one another, ministry. We're here to worship Him by sharing the gospel and saying, this is why it's good news. We're here to worship Him through our finances. We're here to worship Him through relationships and family. Fellowship that happens afterwards over a cup of coffee. We're here to glorify Him. That's why this service exists, is for a body of believers to get together and to do all those things, to worship God. We worship individually in our private lives. When nobody sees us, we're in the room, we pray, we acknowledge Him for who He is. We do that in small groups or, or with close friends or families in, in a small group of believers that know each other well, know each other's needs, pray for one another, encourage one another. And then we do it corporately or congregationally as a group where we gather together to do that together as a body of believers. 
And so our passage from last week, we saw that Jesus confronted people when they started changing the purpose for which they got together congregationally. When they got together as a body, when they got together as a group of believers, when all those things started happening that started replacing the worship of God, Jesus got angry and confronted them. Instead of worshiping God, they took care of business. And they rationalized their behavior. They explained their behavior. They said, well, there is a benefit in people not having to travel with all those animals for sacrifice. There is a, there is a benefit because, you know what, we can only accept the Jewish coin here. We cannot accept other coins. We've got to exchange all those coins for, for giving and for different kind of offering. Uh, it was a needed service. But in reality, it covered up their greed. They were greedy. They focused less on worshiping God and they focused more on making money and making profit. Friends, I want to tell you that there is a similarity here between what was happening then and what's happening with some of us. Because some of us have been focused too much on the wrong thing. Some of us have been exchanging, forsaking, gathering together to worship God as we are directed to do by the scripture in order to make money. Some of us have been focusing more on work and answering emails and dealing with business transactions instead of gathering together and worshiping God through corporate gatherings. Some of us don't even participate in worshiping God through home groups because we're too busy with other stuff that's not as important. Some of us are focusing too much on the wrong things instead of worshiping God. Some of you might be offended by this because, you know, well, I'm busy and my busyness is just okay. And if you're offended by it, that's okay. Because the truth is, Jesus offended some religious people. Jesus offended them because he offended what they loved. He, in fact, that's one of the best or easiest ways to really offend somebody is to offend what they love. So, you know, if I love my wife and my kids and you offend my wife and my kids, guess what's going to happen? You know, I'm, I'm wired to defend, right? So I, I, I go into that defense mode. If you are um, loving a hobby or your car is super important to you and somebody scratches it, man, you, you go through the roof. You get offended when people offend what you love the most. Jesus offended by offending what people loved more than God. Luke 16, 14 says this. The Pharisees who were what? What does it say? Lovers of money. They, were, they loved it. They loved it. They were lovers of money. Heard all these things and they ridiculed him. They were lovers of money. They also loved other things other than money. Matthew 23, verse 6 and 7. And they love what? The place of honor at feasts. They love the respect. They love the attention. They love the prestige that comes with their status. And they love the best seats in the synagogues. You know, one of the things that always was surprising to me that there is this, this kind of this first row right here, right? Like, I don't know why, but everybody thinks it's like a holy place that only pastors can sit at, right? And, you know, it's, it's weird. So we're trying, I'm really excited to see that we're kind of scattering people here. I see Pastor Michael there, I kind of sit there, and Pastor Yaroslav sits here, Pastor Nikolai says, I love that. Because there isn't this, this idea that there is this honored place that, hey, we are in this place of worship and this place is for pastors. And, and pastors love that, you know, oh yes, I'm a pastor, let me show you to your seat, sir. And they also love greeting at marketplaces, the recognition, the influence. 
and being called rabbi by others, teacher. Oh yeah, well, you know what, his opinion is super important. He's a teacher, he's a pastor, he's a deacon, whatever. The Pharisees, the Jews, they loved money, they loved recognition, and they loved their authority. And so what happened is that that love, it redirected their worship of God to the worship of the things they loved. Instead of worshiping God, they worshiped their position and authority. Instead of worshiping God, they worshiped their money Instead of, and their profits. Instead of worshiping God, they worshiped their reputation, their status, their authority. And now Jesus offends all that. He cleanses the temple. He, he attacks all that. This is his father's house. And he, he cleans all that out. And so the Pharisees respond. They respond. And they responded in the wrong way. And we need to learn from how they responded so that we're careful not to respond the same way. And in a minute, we're going to see how they responded. But first, I want to ask you this. Has Jesus confronted your sin? Is there a sin in your life that you can think of right now that God has confronted, that you have, you know, a niche in your heart about, that you have this tug of the Holy Spirit in you for something that you know is wrong, that God is telling you this is wrong and this is sinful? My guess is that most of us can say, yeah, there is something in our lives that God confronts us with, that Jesus confronts us with. Because each of us is confronted by God about sin in our lives. But the Holy Spirit works in our heart. If we're believers, He's within us and He helps us determine and discern what is right and what is wrong. And I know for a fact that it happens because He is holy and you and I are not. And so there will be a huge disconnect between every person alive and Jesus. Hopefully less and less so as we mature in our faith and are sanctified by the power of the Spirit. But, but it's still there. The gap is always there. And listen to this. Jesus is very, very gentle. But he's gentle with sinners who are humble and who understand their sinfulness and they understand the weight of their sin and how far they would be removed from God if it wasn't for Jesus and his cover of righteousness. They recognize their sinfulness. They confess their sins. But he's only gentle with them because when when he talks with religious authorities, it's very different. He's very tough with the Pharisees. He's very tough with the Jews who know the truth. Why? Because they know the truth and they consider themselves righteous. They know the truth, but they think they're just fine in God's eyes. And they say, you know what? I'm so thankful I'm not like that guy. I'm so thankful I'm not like that gal. I'm just a better person in God's eyes. We're better than others. God confronts our sins. We know that. What's different is how we respond to God confronting our sins. So let's take a look at first how not to respond to God tugging at your heart. Let's take a look at the example of Pharisee. So number one, uh, we know that Jesus confronts sin that undermines the true worship of God. Number two... Don't challenge Jesus and ask him for a sign when he confronts your sin. Don't push back and say, well, prove it. Don't push back and say, yeah, I know it's wrong, but how did Jews respond when Jesus confronted their sin? Here's what they did. They resisted and said, prove it. John 2, 18 So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? What what can you do in order to prove that you have the authority to do and say the things that you're doing and saying? 
Because Jesus just messed up their money-making machine. He messed up their plans. He confronted their sin. And there was no sign of repentance. There was no sign of humility. He was saying, Lord, thank you so much for showing us that we were wrong. We were wrong. We were sinful. You're right. We've got to cleanse this thing out. We've got we to gotta change it. Thanks for helping us see that. There's none of that. There's no repentance. They knew he was right. But instead of facing their sin, they ignored the main issue. They ignored the main issue of their sinfulness and instead challenged Jesus' authority over their lives. Friends, we see this a lot with people who are skeptical about their faith, who are, who are either nominal believers or non-believers, and, and they're saying, you know what, I'll believe, but show me a miracle. Anybody knows people like that in your life? Oh, I'll believe, but you know, let's see some raising of the dead first. I'll believe, but let's, let's see all these things happen. Let's, let's see some miracles. Friends, when you hear this, most of the time it's because people choose to ignore their sinfulness and instead they uh, challenge the authority of God in their lives. The truth is this. They don't want or need more evidence in order to believe. The reason they don't believe is because he would confront them about their sin and they don't want to change. I see this a lot with counseling people, with, with talking about people's addictions. The reality is they know the right answer, but they just question that God has the authority in their life to make that change, that they must respond in obedience to him. They're not looking to believe. Um, I mentioned this earlier. There was a, we, we had a visitor at our, our church uh, a while back who after the after the service I came up to him and I, I thanked him for coming and he said yeah you know I, I don't I don't I don't think so I won't I won't come again I said what happened did I offend you anything I said he said you know I, I just believe in this whole love and feel good thing you know I I, I don't believe in having to sacrifice and, and just do all these hard things that you're preaching about what a perfect example I thought of as I was reading these passages, that we know who Jesus is, we know the truth, but we would want to submit to him. So the Jews did not want to submit, and so what they did is they challenged Jesus' authority, just like we challenged Jesus' authority. You see, when we challenge Jesus, we, we are basically saying that we're going to ignore our main issue, our sinfulness, our addictions, the wrong decisions, and all those things. On top of that, when we challenge Jesus, we also say that he is not superior over us, but we are superior over him. Hebrews 1-2 says this, In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the heir. He is the person who is inheriting all of God's creation from the Father. It's his Father's house. And he is the one who has the authority, authority to cleanse it out and to make whatever decision possible to exercise that authority. And Jesus replies uh, later on in verse 219, chapter 2, verse 19, he knows what's going to happen. We see that he knows the future. He's, he's saying, I, you know what, I'm going to die. This temple is going to be destroyed. And on the third day that he would be resurrected, he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Listen, you don't come to the Lord of the temple, to the Lord of your life, and act like you are the Lord of the temple, like you are the Lord of your life. And that's exactly what happens when you're starting demanding things from God and saying, show me this, or show me that, or prove this to me, or prove that this is going to happen. You don't imply that you know more than him. You don't imply that you are the decisive authority in your life because you and I are his servants. We're his disciples. 
when people challenge the authority of the word of God and what he's telling us, what Jesus is telling us, we are claiming to be the lords of our life. That we're in charge. And that's, by the way, what happens when we challenge God to respond with a miracle. Here's what happens when we say, you know what, but you know, you do this miracle and you, you prove this to me. Um, what, what's, what's interesting is he shows you just enough truth to condemn you, to convict you, but because you're not seeking salvation, because you're not looking for repentance, whatever miracle might see, what might happen, or whatever miracle you're asking for, it's not going to be enough for you. Pharisees ask for a miracle, and Jesus answers them in the similar way that he answers in Matthew 12, verses 38 through 40. By the way, Jesus was asked for miracles several times. It wasn't the first time or it won't be the last time that he's being asked to do things in order to prove that he is who he says he is. And he responds every time in a very similar way with this. Here's what he says. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Well, what is that sign? I'm glad you asked because the answer is in the next verse. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He is talking about his death and resurrection. So when he's being asked for a sign, he's saying, listen, the only sign you're going to need, the only sign you should look at is the fact that Jesus is going to die on the cross and on the third day he's going to be resurrected. There is no other sign that you and I need in our lives because that's the sign that God already gave us. He already gives us the truth through his word. He already points us to the only sign that really is necessary to prove that he is who he says he is and he did what he said he is going to do. Pharisees asked Jesus for signs on multiple occasions, like I said. In another passage, Matthew 16, 4, again, and even an adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. Think about it. They ask Jesus for a sign, and he kind of answers in this very ambiguous way. He points them towards his death and his resurrection. And here Jesus does the same thing. Pharisees are challenging Jesus and saying, show us a sign. And he answers in a very similar way, different, different way, but similar. He, in verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What? It took 46 years to build this temple. And you were saying that if it's destroyed, you're going to do it in three days? How is that going to work? By the way, there is an alternative translation that says that this temple withstood 46 years. Not that it took 46 years to build, but it withstood the, 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 the length of time of 46 years. But regardless of which of these two interpretations you, to, you take, the bottom line is that it's not possible to do in three days. They were questioning his authority and his ability, his lordship. And we know that Jesus does not throw pearls in front of pigs. Matthew 7, 6. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. What's fascinating about parables and the way Jesus has, has talked about, uh, or answered is that when he would give an answer, that answer would reveal the truth to those who believe. 
It would reveal the truth and point them towards the truth. But it would also hide the truth to those who don't believe and who are using it to attack Jesus. And so a lot of the parables and a lot of the answers were like that. They, they can be taken two ways. You know, from one perspective, they would make it clear to those who are followers of Jesus, believers, that, hey, this is what he's kind of talking about. Or at least later on, they can say, oh, yeah, that's what he was talking about. We got it. But he would also answer in such a way where his enemies would not be able to go and attack him. And we see that from that verse, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. He hid the truth to those who were not seeking the truth, like the skeptics, like the Jews in this passage. So what Jesus is saying here in this passage is that there are two things. One is that they would destroy the body of Jesus and he would be raised on the third day. But also that the temple itself would be destroyed and we know it happened a little bit later but we also know that the curtain was torn at the time that Jesus has died and we know that the temple would be replaced so instead of a special place where God would manifest himself you know on a third row of the church here uh, where God would manifest himself the most or the holy of holies at that times now God dwells God lives among people not in a special place like a temple. Our worship is therefore it's focused on Him, not on the place. Our worship, if we only come to worship here within the walls of these buildings, we are in trouble. Because our worship should focus on Him regardless where we're at. Whether we're in this building or whether we're at home or whether we're at work or whether we're at school or we're spending time with family and friends. We worship Him through our life everywhere. And the sign that these things are true is the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day. That's the miracle who's proven, proven who He is. That's the miracle that's proven what He has done. And since the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, uh, there is no holy place where God shows up and that's the only place God is among us it's not in buildings it's not in places in fact Jesus himself is our temple Jesus himself is our temple not in the cathedral not in the church not in the beautiful building but we meet God not in the building not in the church setting or a service like that but we meet God through Jesus Say amen if you believe that. That's how we meet God. That's how we experience Him. We dwell in Him and He dwells in us. He lives in our hearts. The church, the people, not the building, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. As we have looked at last Sunday, written in Ephesians 2.21. That's what's happening. So again, number one. The, the Jesus confronts sin that undermines the true, the real, authentic worship of God. Number two, don't challenge Jesus and ask him for a sign when he confronts your sin. That's the bad example that the Jews have given us. They've challenged his authority. They've ignored their sin. And they said, prove to us that you actually are in charge. They weren't looking in humility to look at their sinfulness. They were looking at ignoring it, hiding it because of things they loved instead. And the third thing, how do we want to respond? If we don't want to respond like the religious authorities of that time, how do we want to respond when Jesus confronts us with our sin? How do we, how do, we do it today? How do we do it when we're at home or at a church service or, or, or when we read the scripture? Because there were the religious skeptics and there were the disciples and they both saw the same event. They both saw exact same thing happening. 
They both experienced the same death and resurrection. They both experienced what Jesus was saying. They were given the same signs of his resurrections, resurrection, but one group refused to repent and instead asked for proof and eventually crucified the Lord. And the other group believed. The other group actually accepted it. Maybe they didn't get it all at first, but they, they understood it uh, eventually, and they responded very differently. We know that from John 2.22. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples, listen to this, remembered that he had said this. They didn't get it at first, but they got it now. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. By the way, this verse very clearly places the teaching of Jesus and the scripture on the same level. Because God is, Jesus is the word of God. So that's the response that John wants us to have. All of the Bible... And we've spent three and a half years on this, going through all of the overview of the Bible. All of the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament and the Revelation, it all points to Jesus. Either his coming or his return. It all points to Jesus as a sacrifice for our sin. And that's why all scripture, all of the Bible is profitable. It's, it's good for us because we need to learn how to see Christ in the Old Testament. And we need to see Christ in the New Testament. And we need to see whom we're going to be with in eternity with Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And the scripture is the only source, the only, tr the only source of truth. It is the only uh, source of truth about who Jesus is and what he did and how he did it. And we got to be really careful with that because over time we kind of learn to paint our own picture of Jesus, our own portrait of Jesus. We pick a few Bible verses that we really connect with and we say, you know what, this is my Jesus and my Jesus is this, this soft, spoken, very gentle individual who always loves, always forgives, never confronts, never offends, and is, never, is never flipping tables and scattering coins and with a whip chasing people out of the temple. We must be careful to ignore the parts that make us uncomfortable. The Bible is true, and it is the only source of revelation from God to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And what that scripture is telling us, what the Bible is telling us, is that Jesus is the new temple. He is the new temple. And when God opens up our eyes to see who Jesus really is, then we believe more and more in him. Then we believe more and more in understanding who he is and, 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 um, and, and seeing his character, he, seeing his attributes, seeing who he is. Believing in Jesus is not like jumping off of a cliff and thinking, I hope Jesus is going to catch me at some point before I hit the bottom. Believing in Jesus is a step. A faith in Jesus is a step of faith. And yes, from that point on, from that first step, we are saved. And we are secure in Him covering us. And yes, we are going to be in eternity with Him. But then for the rest of our lives, we make more and more of these steps of faith. We grow in that faith. Because if we place our trust... In what Bible teaches about Jesus and who he is and what he's done, then we will believe progressively into who he is and what he's done. Think about it. Disciples, when they started following Jesus Christ, they believed him. They wouldn't have followed him if they didn't believe him, right? So they didn't understand everything, like I said. They didn't get it. They didn't connect all the dots. They, they didn't understand all the truths, but they believed enough to accept him as their rabbi, as their Messiah, and they didn't understand all of his teaching, but they believed enough to follow him. 
And then he does his first miracle. What was his first miracle, by the way? He turned the water into wine at a, um, uh, at a wedding, right? And so he does his first miracle, and, and here's what it says in John 2.11. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And what does it say after that? And his disciples believed in him. Well, wait a second. They were already his disciples. They were already following him. So why is this saying that they believed in him if they already believed in him? Yes, they already believed, but they believed again because they believed more. Their faith manifested more. They understood more about who God is. And then after the resurrection, they reflect back on all the things that Jesus was telling them and what he was teaching them. And they believed the scripture and what he said again to the greater degree. Friends, here is the application for us. The more we understand what the Bible teaches, the more our faith in Him grows through our understanding of who He is. The more we believe, the stronger our faith is. It it takes time for the spiritual truth to get through to us. The disciples, you know, now we, we look at it and say, man, how can you not get this? But we're looking at it in retrospect. We're doing exactly the same thing, and 10 years from now, I'm hoping that we'll look back and say, man, yeah, that was definitely the hand of God in my life. Now I understand it. Now I get it. We might not understand something that's in the Bible, but don't give up. Keep asking, keep searching, keep studying, keep looking for Him, and you will grow in your understanding of Him. So friends, those are the three things that I want us to remember from this passage. Again, that Jesus confronts any sin that takes us away from worshiping Him. And we have two ways to respond when He does that. Like the Pharisees or like disciples. There are two ways of looking at things. There are two sides of the same coin of the same event. You can challenge Him and say, prove it. You don't have authority. I'm just fine. I'm not going to change. Or you can say, I believe. I understand. And respond in humility. Friends, it is my sincere desire that when Jesus confronts your sin, my sin, that we don't challenge him back. That we are to believe in Him. We are to respond to Him as the one that the Bible teaches was crucified for you and I. Who died for our sin and was resurrected on the third day. And that's the only sign that we need in order to grow in Him. Have faith, be saved, and be in eternity with Him forever. Amen?